Hello students! This video is the first video in the Chapter 6 topic, which is called Thermochemistry. And we'll just be going through everything we would be normally going through as if we were meeting, meeting face to face. Um, so let's get started. So thermochemistry, let's start with the definition. What are we studying when we're studying thermochemistry? So you can have a little bit of a hint if you know that the, the, the root therm is Greek for heat. So, and which you probably guess because we use it with thermometer or thermostat, uh, hypothermia, that kind of thing. So thermochemistry by definition is the study of the heat that is absorbed or evolved, and in this context evolved just means given off or produced um, by chemical reactions. So it's really the intersection of heat energy and uh, chemical reactions. So the study of the heat that is absorbed or evolved given off by chemical reactions. And um, it's something that we've been kind of ignoring the whole time in chemistry. We've, we've been very much focused on matter. If you put these two reactants together, say for a precipitation reaction, um, what products are made? How do the atoms get rearranged? That's really zeroing in on the matter component of the universe, but in our natural created world, there's two components. There's matter, there's also energy, and um, energy is the other component that, that's going on. There's a lot going on with chemical reactions when it comes to energy, um, specifically um, in terms of the heat coming in or coming out, um, and so that's what we're studying with chapter six is thermochemistry. All right, so before we get into um, it much farther, we actually do need to do just a little bit of review on energy. This uh, is something that we did talk about in chapter one, but we'll add a little bit to it here. So let's talk about what is energy, and then we'll talk about the forms of energy and a few kind of main, main concepts here. So energy is the capacity to do work, and what we're going to find is that work is applying any force over a distance. So sometimes people will, will express it as work equals F times C, applying any force over a distance, which is essentially one way to think about doing work is moving matter. Because when you move matter, for instance, if I am lifting up this pen, I'm doing work on it because I'm moving matter and I'm applying a force across a distance. So that's um, how you think about work. So the capacity to do work or to produce heat. And we'll talk about heat in much more great detail later, but that's how um, I would have you define energy, the capacity to do work or to produce heat. Most people will recall that there are two forms of energy in no particular order. There's potential energy and there's kinetic energy. It's one form or the other. Potential or kinetic energy. Let's start with potential energy or let's start with kinetic. Kinetic energy is the energy that is associated with movement or motion. We've talked about that before. Whereas potential energy is associated with position or composition. And I believe you have um, you have notes on that from the last time we talked about energy. So I won't go into that too much too much more. Um, I want to kind of expand on this a little bit from where we, we where we left before. Let me pause right here for a minute and take us back to something that we learned in chapter um, five. We learned the equation in one of my videos. I think it was the one for for kinetic molecular theory for kinetic energy. And kinetic energy is one half. M, which stands for mass, V, which stands for velocity squared, one half mv squared. And from this equation, we can kind of um, deduce the unit for energy. I, I, don't think, I don't think I've done this before, so if it's the first time, that, then make sure it, it shows up in your notes. Um, we know that the SI unit for mass is, we learned this on the first day of class, is the kilogram. That's the SI unit for mass. 
And the SI unit for velocity, think of velocity as speed. So how do you measure the speed of your car? It's miles per hour. So it's distance over time. Okay, that's how we measure speed or velocity. How would we measure distance in the SI unit? That's the same thing as length. That would be meters. So that's what I'm going to put in for V. And how would we measure time? Because remember, what I'm going with here is velocity is distance over time. We would measure time in the SI unit as seconds. So that becomes meters per second. That's how you would, um, that's the SI unit for velocity, which of course we're going to end up squaring. And don't worry about the, oops, don't worry about the one half, okay? But what we're going to, what we're going to discover here is what a joule is. One joule is equal to one kilogram meter squared over second squared. See, that's a joule is a derived unit. We've mentioned this before. A derived unit is just derived from smaller units, but it comes straight from the equation for kinetic energy. That's how we actually um, came up with the joule. Remember, all units are man-made, so that's where that's where the joule comes from. So that's how we're going to be measuring energy is in joules. More often, kilojoules because a joule is actually not that not that big. So kilojoules would be a thousand joules. I'll just jot that down here. You're going to be using this quite a lot. One kilojoule is equal to a thousand joules. That would be your conversion factor that you would use anytime you had to convert between kilojoules and joules. Okay, so that's what a joule is. Um, a kilojoule is just a thousand of them. Other units are the calorie, the kcal, we're not going to be using those units, just joules and kilojoules for, for energy. That's the unit. All right, now let's just also mention, I can't remember if we've talked about this before, but basically the chemists, I guess you could call subtype or kind of like the type of kinetic energy that chemists usually are um, thinking about, we call it thermal energy. Thermal energy. It's a type of kinetic energy, and it's the energy associated with temperature. And you're familiar with it because um, everybody knows that you, if you put a beaker of water on top of a heat plate and you turn that heat up, um, you will almost instinctively know, most people know, that the molecules will get, um, will move faster. That's, and so, so as the temperature increases of a uh, substance, the kinetic energy is increasing. And that type of kinetic energy is what we call thermal energy. It's the movement of the molecules as they're getting hot. If you wanted to write that in your notes, thermal energy is associated with the, the movement of molecules as they're getting hot, okay? That's a good way to, to say it. So it's a type of kinetic energy. In terms of potential energy, there's also a chemist's subtype. And I guess what I'm saying is that kind of the way that chemists would think about it based on their field and based on the kind of the questions that we ask in chemistry. The chemist's subtype of kinetic energy would be, or sorry, of potential energy is called chemical energy. And this is the energy that's um, contained within, within, W slash I means um, within, contained within atoms and molecules. Um, and so it's the energy of the, of the interactions between the electrons and the nuclei. It's the energy of the, within the, within the chemical bonds. It's the energy um, of the attraction between uh, cations and anions. So that kind of thing. So it's, it's the energy within a substance. Um, so um, just as an, as an example of, of chemical energy, when we think about water, H2O, we've drawn it several times. So say you have a sample of water. So pretend that this was water here. It has both thermal energy because it's the molecules are moving, but never forget that there is a ton of energy right inside of that substance. It's in the bonds. It's in the atoms. Um, and that is what we call chemical energy. Let me just 
make sure I'm still yeah, that's what we call chemical energy, and it's a type of potential energy. It's, and you, you looking at it, you don't think about the fact that it's there, but during chemical reactions, when the bonds break and it gets released, the evidence, the proof is in the pudding. There was a lot of energy, energy in there. So, um, uh, and anyhow, so so that's something that we want to kind of keep in mind in, in terms of the types of energy and how chemists would think about it. Okay, so now another thing we need to think about when we talk about thermochemistry is um, system versus surroundings. So the key point here is this. In order to track energy changes, because the world, the universe, is all about changes in energy. With the mere fact of me lifting up my pen, I'm exchanging energy with the pen. I'm losing energy. I burned some calories there. Um, and the pen gained energy because now it has more energy than it did down there, which is revealed as soon as I let it go. So the whole universe is changing. Energy is flowing from this to that. And it's a constant, it's a constant um, thing that's happening. So in order to track what's going on and to track energy changes, um, we must always define what's called the system versus the surroundings. These are terms that you'll use constantly in this chapter. You'll see it in the questions, the system and the surroundings. It's, it's an essential um, part of thermochemistry. So what is a system? What is the surroundings? A system is the substance. Remember, substance is our catch-all phrase for any instance of matter. Everything is a substance. The marker was a substance, but so was my arm and all that. So the substance under study. Whatever you are studying, you would define as the system. Um, in chemistry, if you have a chemical reaction, that is always going to be your system. Most of the time, what we are going to be looking at is chemical reactions and then, you know, do they produce heat or do they um, absorb heat? That is always going to be your system. If you want to kind of make sure you just um, seal that in your mind, because that's what you're studying is the chemical reaction and what it does. So that's what a system is. What is the surroundings then? The surroundings are all substances um, with which the system can exchange energy. And that is what the surroundings are. Okay, so let's... Um, Let's kind of diagram, actually, let's just come back to that concept of a beaker full of water. Um, let's pretend that you're asking a question, what is the boiling point of water? And I know we know what it is already, um, 100 degrees Celsius, but what, what if we didn't know? Okay, so what if we were the first ones discovering this? So what is the boiling point of water? How would you just, how would you test that out? Hopefully you can envision, you would put it on a heat plate or over a flame or something, get it, get it warming. And as long as you had a thermometer in there, which could read the temperature of the water, the boiling point simply is the, is the temperature at which something boils. So it's a, a point, whether it's boiling point or melting point is the temperature. Um, so we would turn up the heat, we would watch to see it bubbling, which is, essentially is just evidence of, of boiling. It's just um, vaporizing under the surface there, but the bub, you know, it would get vigorous and bubble, and that's when it starts to boil. And you would then read the temperature, and you would likely see that it was 100 degrees Celsius. So just that little thought process here. What is the system in our experiment? It's the substance that you're studying. We're asking a question about water. So the water, and only the water, is the system. Therefore, what is the surroundings? The surroundings are all other things in this whole universe that can exchange energy with the water. 
if it can give heat to the water or if heat can, or if heat can flow out from the water to it, it would be considered the surroundings. So let's just kind of think about what the surroundings would include. The surroundings would include many things. The heat plate. In fact, the heat plate is the thing that is supplying the energy to the water. Um, the beaker. The beaker can exchange energy with the water. In fact, it does. The water will actually um, give off heat to the beaker and it would make it hot. So the heat plate, the beaker, the air in the room would be also part of the surroundings. The thermometer would be part of the surroundings. And then never ever forget, because it actually is gonna come in handy when we start thinking about endothermic, exothermic, is your hand. Because when we start thinking about how things feel to the touch, we wanna think about this. Your hand will also be part of the surroundings. Um, so it's not part of the system, it's part of the surroundings. So that's kind of one thing I also like to mention at this point here. Okay, now, now that we have the um, system and the surroundings defined, we can go ahead and learn a few more concepts, a few more terms here. There is a um, term that we're going to use a lot in this chapter called internal energy. Internal energy. Now, when you see a letter E in any equation or any graph, any chart, letter E doesn't just stand in, in, in science for energy. It's not just energy in general. Letter E stands for internal energy, okay? And so that's what we're going to use it as as well. So what is internal energy? Internal energy is the sum total of all the kinetic energy and potential energy in a, um, in a, su a substance. Okay, I kind of already hinted at this. Um, before, but let me just say it one more time. You have a beaker of water. There are two places where energy is happening in that water. Okay, the first is the kinetic energy of the water molecules moving. All matter moves. Unless you are at absolute zero, which is just a theoretical, no one has ever been able to get absolute zero, it's just a theoretical bottom, all matter moves. Liquids, or well, we know gases move, constantly um, colliding all over the place. Um, liquids flow past each other, okay, the molecules will slide past each other. Solids, remember, even though in their fixed positions, they will still vibrate. Matter is always moving, like I said, unless you're at absolute zero. Now, as you go colder, it moves slower, for sure. As you go hotter, it moves faster, okay? Um, the things that move fastest are gases, okay? All of that's true, but all matter is moving. So there's kinetic energy in the sample, but there is also within the molecule lots and probably even more energy in the bonds, um, in the molecule itself, in the atoms, between the subatomic particles. There's tons and tons of energy. It, it, it is more, for sure. So, um, the internal energy includes both of those things. So it includes the kinetic energy and the potential energy in a substance. All right, one of the things um, that we wanna um, state is that uh, all substances have a certain amount of internal energy. We could, um, sure somebody could calculate how much internal energy this has this pen has in this position. Now it would have a different amount of energy if I moved it, but right here, it would have, by the way, higher energy. Because um, I, I think I've said this before, but the more unstable something is, the higher in energy. The more stable something is, the lower the energy. But that's a digression. Substances have a specific amount of energy, okay? However, in Science, we're usually more interested in the change in energy during some chemical reaction or during some process. So usually that's 
more of our focus is delta E. How does it change? How does something, uh, a substance change in energy? Now, anytime you have a delta, um, delta is always final, the final minus the initial state. Final minus initial, no matter what. Delta is always final minus initial. So delta E would be the, the, the final energy, amount of energy, minus the initial amount of energy. And that's how you would be able to calculate a delta E. So let's go ahead and just say that um, I can just even use, I can even use this marker as an example. Okay, so say if my process, here's me, and I have my marker down here, and now I have my marker listed up high. Okay, in this process, this is just, this is not even chemistry, this is just in general, okay? In this process, this is my final state, so this is me lifting up the marker, this is my initial state. Would my delta E be a negative number or a positive number? Well, if the final has high energy, like a high number, and the initial has low energy, high numbers minus low numbers are positive numbers. And if you, if you can't conceptualize that too well, just put in pretend numbers. If you have a bigger number like 10 and you final minus initial and you subtract a smaller number like 5, you're going to get a positive number. A positive delta E is an increase. So anytime you have positive deltas, that's, some people like to think about it like that. A positive delta in anything, no matter what you're measuring, is an increase. So me lifting up the marker, the marker is receiving an increase in energy or a positive delta. If I go backwards and I um, lower the marker, then that's going to be a decrease in energy, the opposite. It would be have a negative delta E. Um, we'll explore that more when it comes to especially things like delta T, but just wanted to, to talk about that a delta E is positive, that's an increase. Whenever you have a delta E that's negative, that's a decrease in energy. Whatever your system is, it's experienced a decrease in energy if you have a negative delta. That's because your, your final is a smaller number than your initial if you've experienced a decrease. And if that's confusing, marinate on it until it's not. Because it, it kind of can get a little bit confusing, but you can just marinate on it, put in some pretend numbers and make sure that you understand. So that's one way we think about delta E is just, just flat out the, the final amount of energy minus the initial amount of energy. The other way that we you're going to think about delta E at least fairly often is, so let me box that, that's one of the delta E equations I would like you to know, is this one here. The change in energy for a system will always equal the negative change in energy of the surroundings. So let's just box that. Let's think about that for a minute here. Okay. This, let me start out by saying it like this. This, what I'm representing as an equation, is actually just, I guess you could say also known as the law of the conservation of energy. You wouldn't think it necessarily until you really think it through. But this really is just a restatement of the law of the conservation of energy, which I believe we've already discussed, is also known as the first law of thermodynamics. Okay, I won't write it because I'm pretty sure we've already have it in our notes, but the law of the conservation of energy just says that energy can neither be created nor destroyed. It can only be transferred between substances or converted between types like potential to kinetic or vice versa. So what this is saying is that anytime my system experiences a certain change in energy, so let's pretend that the system experienced, a, well, just like it says here, this is a positive, it implied to be a positive number. If your system gains energy, me lifting up the marker, if that's my system, if I'm defining him as what I'm studying, if he gains energy, because he's higher energy now than he used to be. That energy that he now has had to come from somewhere. And 
the exact amount that he gained, something else had to lose in the exact same magnitude. And who lost it? It was me. I was the, I in that case was the surroundings to that system. So what it's saying is that whatever amount of energy that the system gains, the surroundings must lose. If there's an increase to the system, there's a decrease to the surroundings and vice versa. If the system has a decrease, the surroundings would have an increase, which is what that negative does. It would just flip the sign to whatever your system undergoes. All right, so that's another way of thinking about delta E is that um, there's no overall loss of energy. If the system gains it, the surroundings lost that exact same amount of energy um, in one way or another. All right, so moving on, let's apply this now to chemical reactions. Because I've been talking about the marker and up and down and all that, and that's, that's all fine. It's all true. It's not really chemistry. Um, so let's now kind of think about how that relates to chemical reactions. Okay, so let's go ahead and consider um, a chemical reaction. Consider this reaction. So uh, let's go carbon, solid carbon. We're reacting with oxygen gas to make CO2 gas. Very simple reaction. So one of the things you'll remember is that a reaction is always assumed to be the system um, in, in this kind of uh, context. Okay, so here's the thing that we want to kind of understand. It's a little hard to grasp until, until you just grasp it and then you're like, oh, okay. Um, every different type of matter, so carbon dioxide gas molecules, solid carbon, oxygen gas molecules, has an inherent amount of energy in it, internal energy, based on the bonding, based on the size of the atoms, based on all different things. It just does. And, and then as you get mixtures, like more complex pieces of matter, they all have different amounts of energy. Um, so every matter has an inherent amount of energy in it at any one given time. Okay, and one of the things that we just kind of have to accept to understand this part is that CO2 gas just happens to be a lower energy substance in terms of how much energy is in it when compared to this, these amounts of these two species. These are just higher energy substances total. So it's just looking the react, you know, um, comparing the product to the reactant. So that part we just have to accept. Don't try to search for the reason because I wouldn't even be able to explain the reason at this point. But we just accept that this has has a uh, this is a lower energy substance compared to the two the sum total that you started with. These were higher in energy. So to understand um, to kind of understand these um, uh, these uh, chemical reactions, or whatever. One of the things that you'll find helpful is to learn how to draw what are called energy diagrams. These are um, let me just write energy diagram. These are really useful um, in chemistry and become even more useful in Chem 102 when you start learning things like um, kinetics or um, equilibrium issues and things like that. You're going to draw energy diagrams quite a lot. They're actually easier than they seem. So if you're ever asked to draw an energy diagram, and I believe you will be asked at some point, all that it is is a little plot with a, a y-axis and an x-axis. The y-axis, you're always just gonna, you're just gonna write energy. If it's an energy diagram, just write an E, which once again is um, refers to internal energy. On the x-axis, there's a bunch of different phrases that I've seen. I've seen the word time. I've seen the word reaction coordinate. I kind of like the word reaction progress. So that's what I'll use on, on the x-axis. So that's the basic of an energy diagram. And with an energy diagram, all that you do is instead of writing the reaction just straight across like we usually do, you still write it react and arrow product, but you're, it's like a topographical map. You're going to put higher energy substances high up on the y-axis because energy is being, we're plotting it on, on like a y-axis. So since these are higher in energy, we're going to write them up high. 
So you still write your reactants first to the left. And then we're going to draw our arrow. But because this substance is lower in energy, requiring it to be written lower on the y-axis, we're going to write it like low. So I don't have any numbers or anything. But it's just, um, this is how you would draw an energy diagram. And the arrow, therefore, is going to be tilted. So in this case, because your reactants were higher in energy than your products, that arrow is going to go down like that. And that's the energy diagram for this reaction, you know, with the assumption that you are given this information, that, they, that this was lower in energy than that. Now, let's talk about delta E. We just learned that delta E, any delta is final minus initial. So in a chemical reaction, the products are your final state. And that's how you can think about it. The products are where you end up, the final state. The reactants are your initial state. So will delta E be a positive number or a negative number? Final minus initial. Small number minus big number will give you a negative number. Think about 5 minus 10. That gives you a negative number. So this delta E is negative. In other words, the reaction, the system, um, loses energy in this, in this, during the course of this reaction. Now, what this, and by the way, this is the delta E of the reaction. I guess I'll just call it the delta E of the system. Where does that extra energy go? It used to, you used to have a lot of energy when they were the reactants. You have less now. Where did it go? The key here is that that extra energy, that extra energy will flow into the surroundings. Because as we remember, law of the conservation of mass says the energy has to go somewhere. So it's going to go from the system into the surroundings. And so the surroundings will experience a gain in energy, okay? I guess you could say it like this. The delta E of the surroundings will be positive. They're going to gain energy during that, um, during that, because of that chemical reaction. And the amount of energy that he loses is the exact same amount of energy that he gains. That's the law of the conservation of energy. Okay, so now let's talk about, we keep some of this stuff here. Let's talk about what we call the reverse reaction. We have, I, we've never really used that terminology yet, but it's actually very common terminology in chemistry. The reverse reaction is literally where what we used to call the product, we now call the reactant, CO2. So remember, he was the, um, let me write the word, the reverse the reaction. We're going to examine the reverse reaction. He used to be the product, and he's now going to be the reactant. And let's turn him into see, solid carbon and oxygen gas. Now, here's where we want to make sure we understand this. CO2 gas inherently has always been and will always be, in comparison to these, the lower energy substance based on its nature, based on its like I said, it's bonding and all the, the internal aspects of that substance. Whereas these, cumulatively, some total, are higher energy substances. How it breaks down, we don't need to get into that. I'm sure this has way more energy than this, um, just because gases have more than solids, but that doesn't matter. Just these would have... Um, inherently higher energy. So now let's draw our energy diagram for this. Still the reactant gets written first. Lower energy, we're going to plot him low. And it turns into the products. The products are higher in energy, so it's going to look like this. And the arrow, therefore, is going to be an up arrow. So reactant to product will require an up arrow for this energy diagram of the reverse reaction. So now let's go through it again here, delta E. Well, delta E for this system, for this chemical reaction, will be negative or positive. Final, because the final state is the products, minus initial. Big, minus small, 
think 10 minus 5, that's going to give you a positive number. The delta E of the system is positive. Your system gains energy when this reaction happens. But once again, logic or the law of the conservation of energy says it's got to come from somewhere. That extra energy that it didn't used to have but now it has, has to come from somewhere. Where does it come from? Hopefully you're seeing it. It comes from the surroundings. Energy will flow in from the surroundings. It must be supplied from outside. And therefore, the delta E of the surroundings, the surroundings are actually going to lose energy because they had to supply it. So they're going to have less than they used to have. That will be negative. And in the same way, whatever amount the system gains, the surroundings has to lose. So that's kind of what we're getting into with just system and surroundings, and especially relating it to chemical reactions. Now, we will relate this to endothermic, exothermic. Not in this video, but in a subsequent video. That's going to require us to learn a concept called enthalpy, which is related, but a little bit different. So we will save enthalpy for a little bit later. But yes, this is related to exothermic and endothermic. If you kind of already know that a little bit, it's coming, and it is related. All right, so let's see here. I'd like to make this video about an hour and see how far we can get in an hour. Um, there is, uh, let's see where we're going through here. Um, okay, so let's ask this question. How does all this energy flow between system and surroundings? Okay, so we're saying energy comes in from the surroundings. Or energy is released into the surroundings. Well, fine, but how? Okay, what, what, let's get something that we can hold on to here. It's something that we can grasp. And so the answer to this question is that there are two ways. There's actually two options, okay, for which system and surroundings can exchange energy. And they are via heat, via meaning through, or, and it's really an and or, okay, but let's just say or, or through via work. So we've got heat and we've got work. All right. Oops. Okay. In some ways, this might not be that hard of a concept. I've been talking about lifting up my marker. I, and if, I, if the marker is the system, which let's make it the system, um, I exchange energy with it when I lift it up. I give it energy. It experiences an increase. I experience a decrease as the surroundings. I did that through work. I moved matter. I didn't heat it up. I moved it. Okay, so that's through work. Whereas with our beaker that we were talking about, you know, the boiling point of water and all that, the water got an input of energy when we put it on the heat plate. But it wasn't through work, so to speak. It was through heat. Heat went from the heat plate into the water. So you can kind of conceptualize that there's really kind of two ways. One is to just do some work on it. The other way is to infuse it with heat. Both of those will input um, energy into the system. So I didn't even write anything on the board there, but just kind of, kind of conceptualize there's, there's two really methods that you can exchange energy um, between a system and surrounding, and it's through heat and through work. Let's kind of go and, and flesh these out just a little bit more. Let me give you a little bit about heat here. Heat. First of all, heat is what we are describing when we use lowercase q. Not capital Q, lowercase q. So in, out, in all of our um, equations and stuff, that stands for heat. You can imagine why lowercase h wasn't available, because lowercase h was height. Um, you know, we used that in uh, the um, equation for our calculating the volume of our cylinder, um, pi r squared h and all that. Uh, 
So that's already been used. So that's why heat, that's why heat is lowercase q. Let's talk about heat for a minute. We have a sense of what it is. We turn heat on, we feel heat, all that. You have a sense of what it is, but what is it by definition? Heat is the flow of energy um, caused by a temperature difference between the system and the surroundings. So anytime you have a temperature difference between a system or whatever you're studying and the surroundings, everything else, you're going to have heat flow. Let's think about it for a minute. If that, let's think about that for a second because there's a little bit more we can say about it. So here's me and here's my fireplace. Okay, it's hot. That's kind of a nice thought about heat right there. I mean, you can sense it, okay? Because there's, there's going to be heat coming from the fireplace. Now, even in that little statement, I've said quite a bit here. Why is there heat coming from the fireplace? It's because in the fire, it's hotter than it is out here. If they were the same temperature, in other words, when the fire's out and it's just the same temperature out here than there, there's no heat flow. But when you have a different temperature between two different places, so to speak, you're gonna have heat flow. Now, which way does it flow? You're never gonna have heat going from the colder to the hotter. It doesn't ever, ever go that way. Heat always flows, and I'll use, there's arrows become really handy here. Heat always flows from the high temperature substance to the low temperature substance. It always goes one way. I'll even write that down. Heat always flows from the high temp substance to the low temp substance. Never vice versa, okay? That's a good way to frame it because sometimes things can get a little bit confusing in the mind. Just always think wherever it's hot, heat's going to go from there to wherever it's cold. Okay, so that's what heat is. Um, oh, and by the way, both of these are forms of energy. So heat will be measured in joules. It has units. It's a form of energy. So you're going to measure in joules or kilojoules, just depending on what's most appropriate. It's a form of energy. It's the flow of energy um, coming, you know, from, from two different, or coming from one place to a different place. And now let's talk about work. What is work? First of all, work also gets a letter. Work gets lowercase w, appropriately. We've already talked about work a little bit, um, that work is equal to force times distance, applying a force over a distance. Um, so anytime somebody is, just picture someone moving a box across the, across the floor. As long as you are applying a force across a distance, you are doing work, okay? Um, the one thing about work, actually, yeah, let, let's just leave that there. Let's just leave that there. So I have, that work is the result of applying a force across a distance. I won't write it, but that's what that is. Okay, I'll give you more about work a little bit later, but um, let's leave that alone. Now, let me, let me erase a little bit because now we have another equation for delta E, and this one is the type of equation that you will be doing some, some calculations with. So far, the other, Equations were more conceptual. This one is actually you're going to have to do some calculations. So, um, and that equation is delta E equals Q plus W. So let's kind of box that. That's one that you want to have with the ready for your, you know, whenever the exams come. Um, what this is saying is that anytime you have a change in energy, Okay, and sometimes you'll write the word system here. It's, it's always implied to be about the system. If you don't write it there, it's assumed, okay? So, because so, remember, we're studying the system. So anytime the system undergoes a change in energy, 
because it, the energy can be kind of communicated or, or exchanged in two different ways, you just have to add both of them together. It'll be the total of whatever amount of heat was exchanged plus whatever amount of work is exchanged. So delta E equals Q plus W. Sometimes you're not, you're going to have zero of one and just the other one, but this is the equation that kind of brings these things together. So with these equations, the key point to getting these questions right is that you must consider or remember the signs. All right, the signs, the positives and the negatives. So I'm going to go through with you here. What in the world are we talking about? Consider the signs. If you have your textbook available, hopefully you do. If you look up table 6.3, this is the table that I'm going to kind of recreate here on the board. And for some people, this is really easy and you don't even really need the table. But for other people, the table, I think, becomes pretty crucial. So looking up table 6.3, yeah, um, page 256. Okay, the sign conventions. Essentially, that's what I'm going to be recreating here on the board. Um, so if we recreate this table, we've got a Q, a W, and a delta E. And... Essentially, let's talk about what happens when these are positive numbers. What does that mean? And let's talk about what, what does it mean when they are negative numbers. So kind of this, this is how we're going to construct this table here. Let's start with delta E, okay? That will start at the bottom here. When delta E is positive, what that means, and this is related to what we just talked about actually earlier with our energy diagrams. If delta E is positive, that means the system gains energy. The system gains energy, but there's a few different ways to say the same thing. Gains can also be called absorbs. Okay, and then also another way to say is the way that the book says it, is that energy flows in to the system. Really, those are all saying the same thing if you think about it. If energy flows into your system, you've gained it and you've absorbed it. So just kind of be on the lookout for that kind of terminology because different questions will be written differently. So you want to kind of understand that there's different ways to say the same thing. What happens when delta E is negative, okay? When delta E is negative. What that means or that represents is that your system loses energy. But understand that the word loses can, that can say, um, you could say like uh, releases. That's kind of another, another word that really means the same thing. Or we can say that energy flows out of the system, which is how your book probably, yeah, um, says it in the table. Those are all basically saying the same thing. So that's the delta E line here in the chart. Now, Let's talk about Q and W. Um, Q, let's do Q first. That's talking about the heat. If heat is a positive number, what that means is that the system, let me see how they phrase it here. Yeah, they, they say system gains. They're saying the system gains. They say thermal energy, but let's just say heat. Heat and thermal energy are synonymous. Same thing. Heat, thermal energy, same thing. So the system gains heat, but I want to give you a couple other words that are not in your textbook that mean the same thing. System absorbs heat. System warms. But here's another one that happens quite a lot. System requires. Like if your chemical reaction requires heat to happen, if it's not going to happen unless, it, unless you supply it heat, that's requiring is the same thing as absorbing, which is the same thing as gaining. Okay, essentially what I'm kind of thinking about here is that these are all inputs. Positive numbers are like inputs. It's coming in. The energy is coming in. Let's talk about negative numbers for, for Q or, or whatever. These are all outputs. That's kind of another way that if you, if you like input output, that can be helpful too. If you have a negative Q, Okay, what does it mean to have a negative Q? If your system experiences a negative Q, that essentially means that the system 
produces. Let me see what word they use in the, um, they use loses, which is fine. The system loses heat. But once again, loses is good, all of that works. But other words that you might see that really mean the same thing, produces, releases, evolves. I think that's probably good enough. Those are all synonyms for losing, okay? If your chemical reaction is losing heat, it's producing it, it's evolving it, it's making it, it's outputting it. Um, so that's what it means to have a negative Q. W is a little bit harder um, to grasp. So this is where you might just want to um, memorize it in a way. Anytime you have a, a positive W, that means that your that work is done on the system. It like receives work. Okay. So in other words, if my marker is the system, it experiences a, a positive W when I lift it up because I did work on it, okay? So that's what a positive W would mean. An input of work is work being done on the system, whereas a negative W is work done by the system. And for that one, um, the best way to explain it is if I'm studying this guy and he's my system and he's pushing a box across the floor, um, he would be doing, he would be experiencing a negative W as he's pushing because work is being done by him. Okay. So that's kind of how, what a negative W would, would imply is that you are actually outputting work. Um, all right, so now let's kind of, now that we've kind of got these little clues to the signs, let's do a practice question. And there are other practice questions in your homework as well. All right, so practice question could look something like this. Um, actually, there's maybe, maybe, couple different types of questions. Let's do a couple of conceptual ones and then we'll do uh, one with a calculation. Um, call it this sentence. An ice cube melts um, and cools the surrounding beverage. So picture a glass of water, you put ice cube in it. So the whole point of the ice cube is to cool it. Um, let's go ahead and because we have to define the system or else we really can't answer the question. Let's go ahead. As part of the question, I would have to tell you what the system is. So I'm declaring that I'm studying the ice cube. I want you to answer something about the ice cube. He's the system for my, for my question. Um, would you say, uh, let's ask this question, is the energy exchange, um, let's go four options. It, are you having a positive Q happening, a negative Q happening, a positive W happening, or a negative W happening um, to the ice cube? What what is is the ice cube gaining heat, losing heat, gaining work, or losing work? Hopefully, um, you can tell that the ice cube when it's melting. Actually, let's diagram this. This can be this. This can be helpful. Got water, got your ice cube. All right, which way is the heat? This is, this is kind of helpful. What way is the heat flowing? Always remember, heat flows from hot things to cold things. So the heat is flowing this way. Not that the water was hot, but it's, it's warmer than the ice cube is. So the reason the ice cube's melting it's because it is absorbing heat from the water. So of these choices, there is an input of heat to the ice cube. And therefore, that's a positive Q um, that the ice cube is experiencing. I think the words were uh, 
the, the system is absorbing, the system is warming, the system is um, gaining heat, the ice cube. Um, let's go ahead and ask, actually, let's move off the conceptual question because this becomes even more common when we talk endothermic, exothermic. So I'll save a little bit, you know, that for that part later. <clears throat> let's go ahead and do a calculation. Um, all right, question. The air in an inflated balloon, and let me stop right there and go ahead and say that the air is what I am asking us to analyze here. The air, that is the system, um, warms as it absorbs 200.0 joules of heat. Notice if it's heat, it's measured in joules. It's a type of energy. As it expands, and by the way, why would, it, why would the air expand when it absorbed heat? Why would it expand as its temperature went up? Why would its volume go up when its temperature goes up? That's Charles' law. Remember that? That's just a little reminder. That's just Charles' law. If it's getting hotter, it's going to expand. As it expands, it does. This is all just part of the question, so all of this is supplied. 77.0 kilojoules of work. Calculate the change in internal energy to the system. Alrighty. So this is what I'm going to, this is a type of question that you would need to, to know how to handle here. Let's start with this. What are we asking to calculate? Change, that's delta. Delta is that little triangle thing. Change, that means change in. Change in what? Change in internal energy. So essentially, you are being asked to calculate delta E. Because remember, E is internal energy. That's change in internal energy. If you look at it, you have been given the amount of heat in joules. And you've been given the amount of work in this in kilojoules must have been a much more a more amount of energy. So obviously this is your equation delta E equals Q plus W. So that would be the first thing that I would have you write down. Delta E equals Q plus W. But as soon as you write that equation, if, if I, I erased it, but I wrote something like this, remember the signs or consider the signs. Getting this question right is all about making sure that you get the signs right because q and w can be negative or positive we have to read the question to make sure we read it correctly so it's all in the wording too because the numbers are always just going to be the magnitude of heat the, the amount of heat like the absolute value of heat in the words are the clues to the signs okay but the, the wording is the clue the number the it, uh, they're both going to be presented as positive but they might not be so let's check it out the air warms and absorbs. Warms and absorbs was what the wording of having a positive Q. Warming and absorbing was a positive Q, an input of heat. Not a release, but an input. So that's the clue here that that's a positive amount. Whereas the air does work. There's the wording right there. It does work. Doing work, if the system does work, not that work is done on, but the system itself is doing the work, or work is done by the system, that is a negative output of work. In other words, this number is going to stay positive, but the wording implies that that number is a negative number, even though it's not written here. That's just the magnitude or the size of it. You have to come up with the fact that that was supposed to be a negative W. So now let's just go ahead and plug the numbers in. Q is positive 200.0 joules. 
and I just always put these two things in parentheses. So um, O is adding Q plus W, and W is a negative 77.0 kilojoules. And that is what I need to be able to do to get this question right. Now, hopefully, you know that you can't add apples and oranges. They need to be the same unit to add them. So you're either going to have to put this in joules or this in kilojoules. You guys just choose one or the other. I'm going to choose to put this in kilojoules. 200.0 joules for every one kilojoule there's a thousand joules that's my conversion factor joules cancel 200 divided by a thousand is going to end up being um, positive 0 0.2000 I'll keep my sig fig there kilojoules plus now it's now they're both in kilojoules plus negative 77 point zero kilojoules and now we can get an answer I would go to my calculator and literally just put that in here um I don't have my calculator with me right now where did I put it maybe I put it in the other room but anyhow if it were me your calculator has a negative symbol on it if you look down below I can't remember where it is but there's a negative symbol it's not a minus sign it's a negative symbol I would put in 0 0.2, now you don't have to keep putting the zeros, just 0 0.2 plus negative 77.0. Why not use the calculator's functions? So put in 0 0.2 plus negative 77.0, and you will get an answer, negative 76.8 kilojoules, and that is the right answer for the change in energy. So that's how you calculate the change in energy if you are given the heat and the work. Just make sure that you consider the signs. All right, that is where we're going to stop for today's video. We will continue. We're going to, next we're going to move into how are these things calculated themselves, okay? Um, these will each have an equation that we're going to become familiar with. Um, how do you calculate heat? How do you calculate work? And then we're going to move into um, some thermal energy transfer questions and also enthalpy, exothermic, endothermic, and some issues, um, which is really kind of the more chemistry uh, fun stuff in my opinion. I like that stuff. So that's what's coming up, um, but I wanted to at least get us to this point. This is usually where I get in my first lecture on thermal chemistry. All right, hope you're all doing well. Looking forward to not seeing you. I guess I don't see you, but we'll connect you know, through emails and stuff like that. So take care. Talk to you later.